Our next speaker is Eliyahu Ungur Sargon, who's going to speak about, I may mispronounce this, I'll try Ruhim. Beautiful. Close? <laughs> uh, Ruhim, New Horizons and Challenges. Are you Good morning, everybody. Really great to be here. My name is Eliyahu Longer Sargon, and I've been talking about and working on the issue of infant circumcision ever since I completed my first feature-length documentary film, Cut, Slicing Through the Myths of Circumcision in 2007. I'm here today to talk to you about Bruchim, beautifully pronounced, by the way, which is an exciting new organization that I co-founded with Lisa Braver Moss and Rebecca Wald in October of 2021. I come from LA, so I needed to bring a little Hollywood to the conference. <laughs> the covenant is intact. That's our tagline for the conference. <laughs> We're gonna start with a little etymology. The word bruchim, our, our name, uh, comes from the Hebrew, which has a dual meaning. The first meaning is they who are blessed. Uh, and I think you'll agree with me that people who have been left intact are indeed blessed. And it also comes from the Hebrew for welcome. Uh, it's part of the Hebrew phrase, bruchim habaim, which means welcome. So who are we? We are an advocacy group for Jews who think differently about the circumcision tradition making the choice not to circumcise and really just thinking critically about circumcision introduces a special set of problems for Jews. Circumcision objectors often find themselves in the unenviable position of being alienated from their communities and sometimes even from their families. And Bruchim is here to support and advocate for those of us who think differently about circumcision within the Jewish community. This is our amazing volunteer team. We are a group of passionate, committed Jews, and we meet every month on Zoom to discuss the many projects that we're all working on. We'll be celebrating our first birthday in October. And over the course of our first year, we have accomplished quite a bit. This is our Rabbinic Advisory Council. All of these people that you see on the slide here are rabbis. You'll notice that they come from different denominations. We are a non-denominational organization, and our mission is serving Jews across the broad spectrum of Jewish identity. So what do we do? Well, we advocate on behalf of Jewish families who have chosen not to circumcise their boys. We educate the Jewish community about our critical perspective on circumcision. And we normalize the category of the intact Jew in the community and in the broader world. This is our mission. Let's take a quick detour into some numbers, some statistics, this, a section I call fun with numbers. 
So the United States is the country in the world with the most Jews. There are 7.5 million Jews who live here. And of course, the state of Israel is the second largest population of Jews in the world with 7 million Jews in the territory that it controls. At Bruchim, our focus is on Jewish Americans and the Jewish American community. And if you take the sort of 30,000 foot view of the Jewish community in the United States today, this is, this is what you get, this kind of a breakdown. Now, these are sort of the major denominations. You have Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, other are some of the more minor denominations. I affectionately refer to Jews of no religion as the nuns. You won't find that anywhere else. That's an Eliism. But, um, but they're a very important group. And as with the sort of trend in American life in general, they're a very large growing group. So um, this data comes from the Pew Research Center, and they track um, across multiple religious denominations that actually the largest growing religious group in the United States are the nuns, are the people of no religious affiliation. If you drill down a little bit into the numbers a little further, we can really have some fun with numbers and sort of take a peek at where things are going. Now, this is really cool. If you look at the bottom bar and you let your eyes rest on one color, right? Say, take the, the conservative. And then you let your eyes follow that color block up to the top bar. You can sort of get a prediction of where things are going. So is your bar shrinking or is it growing? And what we can see here from the Pew data, the, bigger, the biggest sort of growers, if you will, uh, are the Orthodox, uh, followed by the nuns, as I mentioned. The nuns are, are growing um, as, as, as we sort of get to younger age groups. Uh, the reforms seem to be losing maybe a little bit, probably to the nuns, but they're sort of holding steady. Uh, the conservative movement seems to be uh, the biggest losers. I have some friends who are conservative rabbis who've been wringing their hand, hands about this for a long time now. They know, they see the writing on the wall. Um, and so this is sort of the picture that we have now. It's, it's fascinating. Um, what does it all mean for circumcision, though? Why am I playing games with numbers for you here? And the answer to that question is really difficult. It's, it's, it's not simple to answer. Um, if you look a little further into the Pew Report, this came out in 2020. They did a survey of 70,000 people. It's kind of the gold standard of social science about the Jewish community here. Here they asked, you know, the percentage of United States Jews, of Jewish Americans, who say that one of these things is essential to what being Jewish means to them, right? You'll, you'll notice that it adds up to more than 100 because they sort of allowed people to select more than one category. But take a look at this, right? Observing Jewish law is at the very bottom, right? Net Jewish, 15%. Um, you might want to say something about circumcision as continuing family traditions, maybe. But again, no one's asking. It's, it's kind of uh, like we just don't know. Like the, the honest answer is we don't know. We don't have good data on this. And so at Bruchim, we have a sort of medium to long-term goal of actually putting together um, a survey. In the meantime, if you head on over to our website, and if you haven't done that yet, please do. Bruchim done online. It's a beautiful website. And what we're doing here is um, we actually have our own little toe dip into creating a bit of a survey. Um, and so if you click on this button, you can get to our survey. And this is just sort of our first step into trying to provide actual data about Jewish Americans and circumcision. Uh, we're also using the results from this. I think there are, is it more than 150 responses at this point? Close to it. Close to 150 responses. Of non-circumcising Jews. Yeah. So 150 non-circumcising Jews have taken our survey. And we, we're getting a sense also of who we're serving through this. Um, I don't want to leave you hanging because we do have a, I do have a, a surprise piece of data that I think you'll be very interested in. If you go over to Israel... Um, this is, as I said, the country with the second largest concentration of Jews in the world. They have 7 million Jews. The categories here are different, um, and it reflects a kind of dramatic difference in the nature of Jewish identity between Israel and the United States. Um, Israel, of course, we don't need to rely on 
Pew because the state keeps obsessive track of the demographics of the country. For more on that, you can see my film, A People Without a Land, if you're interested on why. Um, but I'm talking about Israel because we actually do have some brand new data about non-circumcising Jews in Israel. And this comes from uh, a study that the, uh, a religious Zionist organization did on secular Jews. So in Israel, 43% of the Jewish population is what's called secular. It's not the same as the nuns. I know it's, it's sort of tempting to draw that comparison, but secular Jewish identity in Israel is kind of actively anti-religious. It's a, it's a different category. But there are roughly 3 million secular Israeli Jews, and this is what that survey found. And this is, this is sort of, this is literally the best data I have seen ever on the question of Jews who don't want to circumcise. And if you look at this, 7% are actively, of secular Jews in Israel are actively opposed to circumcision, and 12% think it's not important. So together, uh, the math would be 19% of secular Jews. Now, there are roughly 3 million secular Jews in Israel. If we extrapolate these numbers out, that means that 210,000 Israeli Jews are actively opposed to circumcision. And if we add the non-important category, that's 570,000 Israeli Jews that either don't care about or are actively opposed to infant circumcision. I want that to sink in. This is a huge deal. Um, and again, it's one survey, uh, but I think it's likely an underestimate given who was doing the survey and the fact that they were only looking at that 43% of the Jewish Israeli population. They weren't even looking at the, the, the other par part of the Jewish Israeli population. So I think it's safe to say that at the very least, more than half a million Israeli Jews either don't care about or actively oppose the practice of infant circumcision. Circling back to our work at Bruchim, a lot of our work, actually the, the beating heart of what we do is really phone calls and emails. Families or individuals will reach out to us and will be the go-between with their rabbi or their community or their summer camp. And we basically can verify whether or not that institution or that rabbi or that community will be actively and openly welcoming to families who don't circumcise their children. Sometimes we engage in negotiations on their behalf, and sometimes we find new communities in their area where we place them. And we've also been getting, recently, a surprising number of contacts from prospective converts to Judaism who don't want to be circumcised, and that's something that we're also dealing with. On this note, we recently launched the Mark Rees Inclusion Directory. As many of you know, um, Mark Reese has kept a list of Brit Shalom celebrants for decades now. And at Bruchim, we wanted to honor Mark, of course, by naming the list after him, but we also wanted to expand it into an even broader list that anyone in the world can access through our website. So if you go back to our beautiful website and you click on the inclusion directory, oh, I'm so excited to show this off, this is so cool. We have an inclusion directory that's searchable. And if you click on the first filter, you can get a sense of the scope of what we're trying to do here. We just launched it, we have to build this out. But all of these different kinds of Jewish individuals, organizations, summer camps, we wanna really build this out to be like a green list for Jews who don't circumcise their children in the Jewish world. We also have lots of different denominations that you can search by. And, you know, let's just take Chicago as an example so you can see how this works. If you type in Chicago and you leave the filters as they are, boom, we have a Jewish organization, Judaism Unbound, we have a rabbi, and we have a congregation, and all with links to their uh, respective websites. So a family who has chosen not to circumcise their children can now go onto our website and search our directory. And of course, there's a lot more work to do here. We have a lot of diplomacy to do to get more people on board, but I'm really excited that this is off the ground. Um, just for funsies, because we're in Atlanta, let's see what's going on here. If I type in Atlanta. Ah, 
we have a congregation on our list in Atlanta, and there's the address for, for anyone who's native here. You can go there or refer a Jewish family who chose not to circumcise their boys to this community and know for a fact that it will be welcoming to them. I mentioned that we engage in education work. We've been holding these virtual events now for a year, and they're wonderful, well-attended. Uh, the first one there on the left, that's our Bible scholar in residence, Rabbi Tzemach Yore, who was talking about his fascinating new book, Why Abraham Murdered Isaac. Um, and we had a wonderful event with him. Uh, we, of course, had a launch event for the Mark Reese Inclusion Directory recently. And um, given all of this sort of influx of interest from converts, I decided to spend some time thinking and researching and presenting on the subject of circumcision and conversion recently. I've also been engaged in a project of text studies. Text study is a sort of hallowed Jewish tradition. Jews have been doing it for millennia. And what I've been doing, I've been working on recovering lost voices in the Jewish tradition that are friendly to circumcision objectors. These are voices from the Jewish tradition, uh, some of them from the heart, the beating heart of the legal Jewish tradition, of voices that are friendly to our position that people just don't know about. Uh, so the first one was about um, early rabbinic texts on the concept of the intact Jew and how the rabbis were surprisingly accommodating of intact Jews. And the next one is going to be about the development of rabbinic conversion and its relationship to circumcision. And I'd like to give you a quick sneak peek from that text study here, which will hopefully be up on our social media channels in about a month. But as we move to the Babylonian Talmud, we learn of another dispute that the early Tanaitic rabbis had over the initiatory rites for converts. And this is the first time we learn of a rabbinic opinion that doesn't assume circumcision to be a required part of the conversion process. Our rabbis taught, a convert who circumcised himself but did not immerse, Rabbi Eliezer says he is a convert, for so we find with our forefathers that they circumcised themselves but did not immerse themselves. If a convert immersed but did not circumcise himself, Rabbi Yoshua says he is a convert, for so we find with our foremothers that they immersed but did not circumcise themselves. But the sages say, one who immersed but did not circumcise, or circumcised but did not immerse, is not a convert until he both circumcises and immerses. On the normalization front, we've had quite a busy media year, and I wanted to uh, share with you a little montage of our appearances on these various uh, podcasts and radio shows in the Jewish world that members of Bruchim have been participating in. So here you go. And now, you're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 303. Bris means covenant, not circumcision. Welcome to Evolve, groundbreaking Jewish conversation. This is Bonjour Chai, the circumspect about circumcision edition. Since you uh, launched Bruchim, have you received any pushback from the community at large? What problems do you have with circumcision, an age-old tradition, thousands of years old, that unites every single Jew? It is traumatic. It's traumatic for the infant. Um, I feel that it was traumatic for me as well. The ethical concerns at play are extremely serious and, as I mentioned, touch you know really core liberal values like gender and autonomy. If we find something that God told us to do that appears to be in conflict, with our morals and our ethics, then it's incumbent upon us to adjust our morals and ethics to coincide and be consistent with God. In this week's Parsha, we had a lot of Avraham acquiescing to God's wishes. But in next week's Parsha, we have a, a slightly different Avraham. We have an Avraham who argues with God over the destruction of Sodom and Amora, and he famously says to God, Hashofet kol ha'aretz lo mishpat, will the judge of all the world not perform justice? Now, for Abraham to say that to God, he has to be taking a different approach to what you just articulated. I actually don't think that to oppose a particular Jewish text or a particular Jewish ritual is, like, un-Jewish. I think 
to oppose a particular Jewish text or ritual is extremely Jewish. Like, the, the, the thing that wouldn't be Jewish is if you're just not relating to it at all. What is going on in the world of regular Jews out there who feel this intense pressure to circumcise their children, but at the end of the day, couldn't really tell you why? I think that there's a commonly held belief that infant circumcision, um, because it's the one thing that virtually all Jews still do, it's what's holding us together as a people. I think that this is a logical fallacy. We're back. We're looking at what this organization, Bruchem, is representing. It's a new group. Got a lot of publicity in the Jewish media through this past week. Our guest, Levi Brava Moss, is the co-founder, president of Bruchem. Elio Unger Sargon is a founding executive board member of Bruchem, and they advocate for those that don't have circumcision. They have a community. Rabbi Benjamin Silver is the spiritual leader of the Young Israel of Long Beach. He is not a member of Bruchem. Rabbi Silver isn't yet a member of Bruchem. I'm not sure if he's playing. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Silver, yeah, but- I'm playing to join. <laughs> well, definitively not to be becoming a member of Bruchem, but thank you for the clarification. <laughs> We've got Gary Steingart. He's the New York Times bestselling author of the memoir, Little Failure, which which covers a lot of his time uh, growing up in Queens. He's also, and folks may know him this way, as a is a literary consultant to the HBO hit Succession. You know, so for me, this was easily the first experience I've ever had with being so depressed that I was I was suicidal. I just couldn't understand how I would continue living with this, how I could continue to be a father or, a, or certainly a husband because obviously sexual activity was out of the question. In researching that New Yorker piece, I kept running into other men who had had circumcisions, many not Jewish, you know, because others, other cultures do this too. And in America, we do this uh, pretty much as a medical procedure, or at least have, uh, who have also had unbelievable, you know, disasters with their circumcisions. In the wake of the recent article by Gary Stengart in The New Yorker about his own botched circumcision and his resulting position against circumcision, a new wave of articles and social media posts about Brit Mila and the Jewish community has surfaced. And Bruchim has had its launch, wading right into the debate. I don't know that, you know, either of you have yet convinced me that we should get rid of it, but but you've really got me and I think a lot of other people think about it maybe maybe for the first time we're seeing a different conversation already in the jewish community because we're proposing this idea of including these families and including this in the converse in the jewish conversation it has shifted and we notice this in the press and in uh, in the interviews that we've done that somehow this is this is making it easier to talk about and that certainly is what will make more people think about this as an option. Bruhim isn't just about asking for permission, like, please include us. It's, you know, how do we still show up and how do we still engage, even when our feelings aren't in line with the majority? My sense is that there will be an ongoing need for Bruhim or for organizations like it, because thousands of years later, we're still talking about Brit Milah. And my hope is that thousands of years from now, we'll still be talking about Brit Shalom. I feel like it's an unstoppable train. Even though I'm not part of an organized Jewish community, I, you know, as a fellow Jew, I can't help but be proud that people are uh, addressing this issue with so much eloquence and, and thought and empathy. Because I think ultimately changing our minds about this will require a lot of empathy. So that's our, uh, our little media package for you. Um, if you missed it, this was serendipitously, it, uh, this article came out just around the same time that we launched Brooklyn last October. This is a big deal. This is a big deal um, that the New Yorker published this. Gary Steingart is a very, very serious uh, writer, a uh, very important figure. And here's that quote again. Uh, he was talking uh, on a podcast with our director of strategic initiatives, Max Buckley. He was talking about Max and the work that we're doing at Bruchim when he said this. And um, I just, I'm just very proud of, of the work we're doing and uh, that it's being recognized in this way. All right. So how can we help you? As I've touched on in this presentation, Jewish identity is complex and navigating the ins and outs of the various kinds of Jews and how they relate to circumcision can be challenging. We stand as a resource for you or for anyone you encounter who's trying to better understand Jewish circumcision from a critical perspective. And if you wanna better understand the history of Jewish circumcision or what motivates different kinds of Jews to circumcise their sons, come to us. If you have any questions or concerns in talking about Jewish circumcision, 
come to us. If you encounter Jews who are feeling alienated from their communities or families around this issue, send them to us. We're here and we're happy to help. Ruchim is your one-stop shop for all of this. How can you help us? So the first thing, and this is really easy, if you're on social media, just follow us on your favorite platform. Um, that will help keep you up to date on the latest, and it will also help us get the word out to more people about Ruchim. Um, you can also, of course, make a direct donation on our website. We are a 501c3, so all donations are tax deductible, and we appreciate all of your support. And then finally, I want to talk about how you can help us from a sort of empathy perspective for the Jewish community and understanding the moment that we're in in Jewish American history. We're coming up on the fourth anniversary of the deadliest attack on the Jewish community in the history of this country. This is the Tree of Life synagogue shooting that uh, a gunman went into a synagogue on Shabbat and killed 11 people and wounded six others. There's been a, a sort of undeniable rise in anti-Semitism by any metric that you look at. This is from the Pew study I was quoting earlier. As a Jewish person in the United States, do you personally feel less safe, more safe, or not much change at all? And you can see that a majority of Jews in that survey said that they feel less safe than they did five years ago. And of course, Jews who wear distinctively Jewish items even more. And if you look at more recent data on this question, this is from registered voters in the United States this year in 2022. You know, there, there's an expression, two Jews, three opinions. Yeah, not on this issue. This is just basically a consensus. Everyone is feeling it. Everyone is worried about it. So if you want to help us accomplish all of the wonderful goals that I, out, that I outlined in this presentation, Please be disciplined when it comes to expressions of anti-Semitism coming from within the general autonomy movement. I know everyone here is, are wonderful people. I know that you're frequently having to deal with bad faith accusations of anti-Semitism, but we have a sort of mutual goal, right? We are in this together, and if you could help us out uh, by being disciplined about anti-Semitism, it would go a really long way to help us accomplishing our goals together. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful conference. We are going to only be able to take one question because of time. Uh, there's a town hall tomorrow on this subject and Ellie will be here and uh, most of the people in this room so um the way more time to discuss this tomorrow you're gonna take one question <clears throat> and now we have to move on sorry you mentioned that your organization is uh, not a nomination that Jews of all background are welcome I'm wondering if you've had any success reaching the Orthodox and Hasidic communities as uh, they are growing as your um, numbers indicated or do you feel like there's just no hope reaching that part of the Jewish community uh, that question touches my heart because I come from an Orthodox background and all my family are Orthodox. Um, my philosophy on this is to continue to reach out to Orthodox Jews. I've had really sort of counterintuitive success in having conversations in those spaces. The talk line with Zev Brenner clip that you heard was basically an Orthodox audience in New York of about 200,000 people who are listening to us. So I very strongly believe that there's a lot of progress that can be made there. Mark my words, I hope that we will have an Orthodox rabbi on our rabbinic advisory council at some point. I don't know how, I don't know who, I don't know when, but I'm gonna be lobbying hard for that. And I think those conversations can be very productive.
Okay, now we're now we're cooking. Just for all y'all. Shavuot 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 Shavuot